my new friend. I uh, must beg your pardon for the delay. I had intended to be awaiting you on the wharf, but I was uh, cruelly detained. I have been in many uh, unavoidable meetings of late, and I've just come from yet another one. That old anecdote asserts I shall consider the cessation of such meetings to be one of the consolations of death. I, uh, I assume you've met the others. Uh, you, you met Nancy. Well, now then. I am your humble servant, David Douglas. Welcome to America. It is my great pleasure to see all of you here. Lewis, welcome home, son. Good day, all. No, there is uh, nothing to report from the meeting. Well, you have uh, no doubt noticed what long, somber faces surround you and uh, have likely determined that we are all in a state of dismay. Tis true, indeed we are. Fate has cast me in the role of informing you of the source of our consternation. I, uh, I received a letter in late October. You know what, I, I should back up a bit. Um, during those brief stints when we are neither performing nor traveling, we make our home in Williamsburg, the capital of the Virginia colony. Uh, Lewis's wife and sons are there, and it is home to some of our most ardent supporters, many of them uh, possessing great influence here in the colonies. One such dear friend is uh, Mr. Peyton Randolph, who uh, inducted me into the Williamsburg Masonic Lodge long ago. About uh, three months ago, around the time you were packing your bags, 13 of His Majesty's colonies, those here on the continent, sent uh, representatives to Philadelphia for what they're calling the Continental Congress. And these 13 now refer to themselves as United Colonies, and it is our longtime ally, Mr. Randolph of Williamsburg, who is serving as president of the Congress. In late October, I received a letter from my old friend. He, uh, he informed me that uh, on October 20th, the Congress passed 14 resolves, 12 of them addressing the issues you might expect, trade, taxation. The last one calls for committees of safety to enforce the extra legal suggestions as if they are laws. Yes, hmm. Well, uh, of interest to all of us is the eighth resolve, which uh, I, I brought a copy to read for you. It, uh, it states, we will, in our several stations, encourage frugality, economy, and industry, and promote agriculture and uh, the uh, manufactures of this land, uh, especially that of wool. And we will discountenance and discourage every species of extravagance and dissipation, especially all horse racing and all kinds of games, cockfighting, exhibitions of shows, plays, and other expensive diversions and entertainments. Yes. These men of Congress, uh, many of them dedicated theater supporters from throughout the colonies, have uh, effectively banned theater in America. They claim their civil liberties are threatened by Parliament, and they exercise their own tyranny upon us, their fellow subjects. And I can see you are wondering why. I cannot say, friends. The truth is we simply do not know. There is a puritanical influence from the northern colonies and this lingering tension between colonies and mother country, but uh, Mr. Randolph's letter did not offer any rationalization, only the cold truth of the matter. But uh, please, this is a mere temporary setback. Now, we have seen crisis at Christmas tide many times before, and we have always emerged from it unscathed. You talk to the others, they'll tell you. Now, my, uh, my own arrival here in New York, uh, in fact, upon this continent, was in 1758. 
I had just married Sarah and become Lewis's father. Well, initially, I was refused permission to perform. I thought that I could sidestep the appropriate channels and uh, presume to set up a histrionic academy. We'd offer music lessons and evening concerts, performing a play afterward with the uh, complicit understanding that the cost of admission was for the music only. Well, I was nearly tarred and feathered, <laughs> but after a carefully crafted and very humble letter to the New York Mercury, I was granted permission to perform for 13 nights. We opened just after Christmas in the old Wharf Theater down the street. On the final night, declared by the newspaper to be positively the last night of acting in this city, we gave them Richard III. It was uh, Lewis back there in the role of Richmond who spoke those final lines of my first American season. Ne'er let him live to taste our joys increase that would with treason wound fair England's peace. Is that uh, about how you did that, Lewis? <laughs> Good heavens, remember the Stamp Act, Nancy. Oh, back in 65, Lewis's mother and I traveled to London to hire some new actors just like yourselves, Nancy here among them. Would you believe we arrived in the port of Charlestown, South Carolina, four days before the Stamp Act was to go into effect on the same ship that carried the stamp distributor and stamped paper? Well, we were welcomed on the wharf by those sons of liberty and their Vulgus Mobile, who burned the stamp distributor in effigy as he stepped off the ship. I could not print tickets nor playbills. That city was at a standstill. But with the permission of the royal governor to print tickets and playbills on unstamped paper, we opened our theater 11 days into the Stamp Act mayhem. And here's the important part you'll soon learn about America, friends. We looked out into our audience on opening night and there sat staunch loyalists and sons of liberty side by side. They had come together for O'Hara's Midas to the god of, the god of, of oh, 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 don't, don't tell me, the bright god, yes, uh, to the bright god of day. Let us dance, sing, and play, clap hands, every lad with his lass. <laughs> oh, in a city bitterly, divided over the Stamp Act, amidst venomous protests and destruction of property. We had reminded them that they are not so different from one another after all. <laughs> so you see, they need us. Now, uh, last Christmas, we were once again in Charlestown. We had not yet heard about what had just occurred in Boston Harbor. Yeah. See where I'm going, don't you? Apparently every Whig in these colonies was eager to destroy some tea, and we're on stage serving tea and saying, God save his majesty! <laughs> it was uh, awkward, to put it mildly. It is uh, important to laugh, friends. That is precisely why, after an evening of tragedy, we finish off the bill with a short farce. Oh, love. Uh, Speaking of uh, chuckles, uh, you may have just stepped off the boat, but uh, you've already received a mention in the American press. Today's uh, New York Journal contains this letter. Mm. As a number of players, that's you, have arrived in the Lady Gage from London, and it is reported that they are to act among us this winter, I beg leave through the channel of your paper to invite the attention of the public to the eighth article of the association, agreed upon by the Continental Congress. The writer goes on to pay me the following uh, sardonic respect. Uh, As I have knowledge of Mr. Douglas's urbanity, I am persuaded he would not wish to give offense to the good people of this city whose favor he has formerly experienced and who may hereafter render him more essentially. It goes on. The, uh, the author of this letter uh, signs it Pro P. 
patria. Yeah, that should tell you something. I can assure you this, friends. If I have anything to say via the press, I put my name on it. Well, your concern is warranted, but do not despair, please. You, you, you will be provided for until you're free to earn wages. And if in the unlikely event that tranquility is not restored to this continent by the end of January, we will be sailing for Jamaica. There is a fervor there, but uh, the islands can wait their turn. For now, our work is here. I am certain that any day now, the senseless ban will be lifted and we'll give New York the Christmas gift of a benefit night for the poor of the city. This theater will be so full, we'll have audience on stage with us. I'm sure Pro Patria will be here, so I may even dust off that tired old Cato. Oh, <laughs> may his name in every climb excites new patriots in the country's cause to fight. Heroes who are against oppression rise and life debarred of liberty despise. Yes, indeed. Now I'm uh, sure some of you have questions. Let us open our doors. Some of our hopeful audience are just outside. Uh, Mrs. Allen, if you would be so kind as to discover what questions they may have of me. Mr. Douglas, we're so thankful that you've come to join us today. And indeed, we do have some questions and we have new audience members joining us from all over the country, eager to engage in conversation with you. But sir, you were speaking earlier and I was hoping um, that you might be able to elaborate on it a little bit more about your arrival in Charleston just mere days before the Stamp Act was to go into effect? Yes, well, there is a great deal more to tell. Uh, friends, uh, Mrs. Allen was not with us uh, in Charlestown. She, uh, Lewis, uh, the Morrises over there were all in Barbados. I received a letter from Lewis upon arrival there informing me that they would not be traveling to join us. Uh, and, uh, but they did experience some mayhem of their own as uh, in May, uh, there was a terrible fire in, uh, in Barbados, uh, destroyed our theater, several other buildings. Uh, it, uh, it speaks of the character of the people of Charlestown that uh, though still reeling from the economic impact of uh, the Stamp Act, that city raised almost 800 pounds to send to the fire victims of Barbados. But uh, as, as for myself, uh, Sarah and I traveled to London. Uh, she uh, spent time with her children. We stayed over a year. I restocked our trunks with new costumes and properties. I had uh, fine scenic backdrops painted by Mr. Nicholas Daw, the scenic artist at Covent Garden. And uh, we sailed on the Heart of Oak luxurious ship owned by uh, Mr. Henry Lawrence, a fine gentleman of Charlestown. During the passage, uh, uh, we uh, became acquainted with uh, the stamp distributor. A man's name is George Saxby. Well, you can imagine when he stepped off that ship and saw that effigy, the poor fellow was quite rattled. And we were all uh, very concerned for his safety. Well, he fled to uh, Fort Johnson under military escort and was wise not to return to his home. For two days later, this same mob went to the man's house and destroyed it. Now, when I say they destroyed his house, I don't mean they ransacked it. I mean they leveled it. But not before first dragging all the man's possessions out into the street and publicly burning them. From there, they moved on to uh, Mr. Henry Lawrence's home, convinced that he was hiding stamps there. Vulgus mobile, indeed. They were not only vulgar, but on the move. Well, as of November 1st, no business involving paper and ink could occur whatsoever. I believe the only establishments that maintained some normalcy in that city were the taverns and coffee houses. But the people of Charlestown were clamoring for their entertainments at the theater. You must understand, 
There was no stamped paper. It had been hidden away in a warehouse for fear that this same mob would burn it. I arranged through a mutual friend to meet with Governor William Bull of South Carolina and secured his permission to use unstamped paper for our tickets and playbills. I used two printers, one of each political persuasion. We opened on November 11th, and due to a third of our company being in Barbados, it was with a limited fare at reduced ticket cost. But I do believe they, uh, they received their money's worth, as that was the first American audience to hear the voice of our Nancy Hollum over here. And as I said, we showed them that despite their bitter divisiveness, they all share the same basic human desires. Love, money, and liberty. Thank you for that, Mr. Douglas. We have a question from Abby, who is joining us from Michigan, and she has asked, how many actors would travel together in your troupe, and did your group follow a certain circuit? Abby, thank you for your question. Uh, we maintain a company of approximately two dozen performers. Uh, that number does fluctuate a bit from one season to the next. And I do enjoy uh, introducing new actors to an American audience. Um, frankly, there, there are some for whom the, the itinerant life is not appropriate after one season of moving around these colonies. They decide it is not for them. And that creates an opening for someone new uh, to, uh, to come from London, like our new friends who have arrived here today. Um, the circuit is not fixed. Um, depends largely upon the uh, state of our theaters, the weather at times, um, but uh, the circuit consists of uh, Newport, Rhode Island, New York City, Philadelphia, uh, Annapolis, and Maryland, um, Williamsburg, Charlestown, South Carolina, and Kingston, Jamaica. Um, but uh, the weather is certainly a factor in that. We have only performed in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, during one summer. That was uh, three years ago, the summer of 17 and 71, and it was unbearable in that theater. Um, I hope that uh, provides a sufficient response for your curiosity, Abby. I think that it does, sir. Uh, speaking of um, your travels, and particularly to Williamsburg, Arden, um, a good friend of the city of Williamsburg, has asked, if uh, Mr. Douglas and his actors would have to interact with locally prominent citizens as they traveled. And I know in Williamsburg, being the capital of Virginia, I'm sure that you've come across many locally prominent people, um, for instance, Colonel Washington, even. Well, Colonel Washington, uh, yes, there are many distinguished uh, members of our audience. Uh, Peyton Randolph, of course, uh, John Page, uh, Jefferson, uh, but uh, I am glad that you asked, Arden, is it? Uh, glad that you asked about the colonel. Um, what can a man say about such a luminescent individual? <laughs> George, I, um, I have met three individuals in my life who are brighter than life itself. Some of the finest uh, gentlemen that the human race has to offer. And I refer to, of course, to the great David Garrick in London, Philadelphia's Dr. Franklin. And I am blessed to call that third fellow my true friend of many years. I first met George Washington in Barbados in 1751 when we were much younger men. Uh, he, uh, oh, about to enter his 20s, I about to depart from my own. I was immediately impressed by the young man's intellect and passion. We spent many hours in coffee houses engaged in Socratic dialogues. I must say, even at that age, he not only loves the theater, he understands the theater. Well, uh, the subject uh, that he spoke most passionately upon was uh, Cato by Joseph Addison. 
I determined that the next time I saw that young man, I would perform the role of Cato for him. I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid that took many years, as uh, he soon uh, returned to Virginia. And I did not see Colonel Washington again until my own arrival in Virginia many years later, in the fall of 1760. We arrived and uh, within just a few weeks had a new theater built. Could still smell the sawdust in the air on opening night. Well, that theater was built partly due to a generous donation by my longtime friend, Colonel Washington. And indeed, it was there in my theater in Williamsburg where my old friend did see me perform the role of Cato. As well as many additional times through the years, uh, in many cities, many different performances, there would be the Washingtons there in their box seat. And uh, I must confess, I did grow weary of Cato. And in 1768, I retired that play, uh, buried it in the lowest depths of our repertoire, and have only revived it one time in the six years since. And that was uh, back in May, at the close of our season in Charlestown, we performed a benefit of Cato for the suffering people of Boston. And uh, presumably, city of New York will soon see much the same thing right here. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Um, Tina has asked if you ever occasionally write your own plays. Tina, uh, the short answer is no. Now. Uh, we do have uh, many short entertainments that are fashioned by the company themselves, and I certainly uh, make a contribution to that after piece, as we call those. Um, but uh, no, um, we are blessed uh, to live in a, in a century full of accomplished playwrights. Uh, Mr. Cumberland, Mr. Addison, is a central lever. Um, and, uh, but no, uh, my particular talent is for, uh, for making deals. Thank you, sir. Uh, Kathleen, a good friend from Williamsburg, has asked if you could stage any production, which would you put on and why? <laughs> Kathleen in Williamsburg. Thank you for that question. Uh, my goodness, I hope to see you again at our theater in Williamsburg soon. Look for us in uh, about a year. Uh, to answer your question, uh, to put it simply, uh, my favorite role uh, that I've played through the years is Richard III. But over the last three years, there's been an enormous popularity for Richard Cumberland's The West Indian. So to answer your question in the, in the simplest terms, I would choose The West Indian for the financial gain that it would provide for the theater would be packed every single night. Thank you, Kathleen, for that question. Now, sir, we do have a question for you. Um, and a few people, I think, are a bit too shy to ask this question. Oh, please, Mrs. So Allen, please. If you will forgive me, um, we understand that sometimes itinerant actors have a tendency to have a bad reputation. Indeed. Uh, and we were hoping perhaps, sir, you might be able to either put that to rest or, um, well, own up to it. <laughs> like, like our Mr. Verling, eh, friends? <laughs> uh, there was a fellow, William Verling, who performed with us. Uh, he was with us in Charlestown during the Stamp Act, but uh, don't know whether the fellow... Uh, had other designs or whether he simply became rattled by all the chaos that ensued in that city uh, during that time. But uh, Mr. Verling deserted us. We found out later that he had surfaced in Virginia and started a company uh, primarily of, uh, of uh, amateur actors, called it the Virginia Company of Comedians. Well, they, uh, they performed, they rented our theater in, uh, in Williamsburg over the summer of 1768. And uh, as the account uh, tells us, uh, that company ran up uh, exorbitant debt in the city of Williamsburg and then vanished in the dead of night, apparently uh, taking a slave girl from one of the taverns along with them. 
And uh, we heard later that they had repeated the exact same thing in Annapolis after leaving Williamsburg. But, uh, no, this is, but this is a reputation that far precedes Mr. William Verling, and I have taken actions to, uh, to allay uh, those concerns. Uh, after that initial uh, season in 58, 59 here in New York, I left here with a, a letter from Mayor, uh, Mayor John Kruger. And it, uh, it expressed not only the accomplishment, but also the character of the individual in our, our company. I arrived in Philadelphia. We were able to build a theater there uh, in pretty, uh, pretty quick fashion, but uh, due to Quaker resistance that was uh, outside of the, the city of Philadelphia. Nevertheless, very successful. Uh, Lieutenant Governor William Denny of Pennsylvania provided me with a second letter speaking to our character which I took to Governor Horatio Sharp in Maryland in uh, the beginning of 1760. By the time I uh, arrived in uh, Virginia in the fall of 1760, uh, I was able to present three letters to Governor Falk here. And uh, it is uh, an ongoing concern, but uh, I would ask you this, friends, has the, theater, the stage, the theater, have they been abused? Certainly. And so has the pulpit. There have been uh, many profligate players, but also uh, irredeemable parsons. Now, uh, ought a respectable clergyman be uh, held accountable for the actions of a few corrupt ones? Uh, by no means. Nor should an orderly, civilized player be uh, reckoned uh, an idle vagrant and a pestilent stroller simply because there have been such of the same profession. Are there more, Mrs. Allen? Yes, sir, thank you for answering that. Duane has asked what play that you have played that has had the longest run? Uh, Duane, I, I believe uh, it must be Cato. As I said, 16 years I played that role. But I had had enough. I had grown weary of it. Um, of course, I, I, I suppose I've been playing Richard III for uh, at least that long. Uh, to give you my most honest answer, my friend, uh, I'm simply not certain. Fair enough, sir. Fair enough. Um, we only have time for a couple of more questions, Mr. Douglas. But one question that uh, Joe was wondering is, uh, how do you go about earning permission to build the theaters where you perform? Oh, th well, thank you for that question, Joe. It uh, speaks to uh, my greatest talent. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, that, that first theater in Williamsburg in 1760, uh, I believe uh, Colonel Washington uh, donated about eight pounds. Uh, the, the construction uh, budget was in the neighborhood of 150 pounds, and his uh, eight pound contribution earned him uh, his reserved box seat any night that he wishes to come to the theater. And uh, so I took this idea. From here, uh, after that season, we sailed to Newport, Rhode Island. The people of Rhode Island did not want theater there. It was put to a public vote, and they voted no. They said no to theater in the colony of Rhode Island. However, uh, you might be surprised what a few complimentary tickets for politicians can do for you. So uh, I was able to build uh, uh, a theater in uh, Rhode Island, despite the uh, Newport, uh, despite the, uh, the objections of uh, the people there. And uh, this uh, has become uh, a habit in multiple cities where uh, one can make a one-time donation to uh, contribute to the building cost and thereupon uh, receive uh, preserved and uh, preferred seating uh, throughout uh, several theater seasons. Uh, now, my most successful example of that was just last year. Uh, I left the company uh, here in New York uh, was May or June of 1773, and uh, I, uh, I went on to Charlestown alone, and uh, by the, the grace of God, I was able to raise 600 pounds to build a theater there. And on Church Street, in the heart of Charlestown, I now own the most elegant theater in these colonies. 
That's wonderful, sir. We do have a question from Cliff from North Carolina, and he has asked, what is the largest and smallest venue that you've played? Cliff. I do thank you for that question. Um, the smallest venue uh, would likely be, oh, one of the many uh, Caribbean island venues that I played uh, back in the mi middle part of the 1750s. Um, here in Virginia, there are some small houses, uh, Norfolk, Petersburg, uh, Alexandria. Um, I'm afraid I do not have a definitive answer, but I assure you, uh, we have played in many uh, very small spaces. Uh, the largest would likely be uh, our Southwark Theater in uh, Philadelphia at this point. Thank you, Cliff. Well, Mr. Douglas, uh, we cannot thank you enough for your time. I, I know that your time is very precious. I think we only have time for one more question. And sir, this question's come from me and from some of the, the new actors that you've just recently brought in from London. Yes. They would like to know what you believe the function of theater is in society. Function of theater in society, my. Well, uh, there are those who would not have a kind assessment of it, aren't there? Like this pro patria who wrote this letter in uh, today's journal. I uh, sadly have encountered many of that character uh, throughout the years. Most notably, uh, Mr. Hancock of Massachusetts, who has thwarted my every attempt to provide theater for the people of Boston. But I have never entered into any uh, controversy with those who have attacked me. I have, I have overlooked the uh, torrent of uh, incomprehensible abuse that seems so plentifully bestowed upon the theater because my reason insists that uh, the greater part, by far, of those who are enemies of the theater are unacquainted with the, the nature and tendency of dramatic entertainments and of the, the virtuous effect that a well-regulated theater undoubtedly has upon the manners of a people. Entertainments on the stage are, as, uh, as Mr. Addison himself has said, uh, a noble diversion for the accomplishment and refinement of human nature. Sir Richard Steele, author of The Conscious Lovers, has explicitly declared that he fashioned that entire play around one scene, the one written to condemn that pernicious act of dueling. And we are all well acquainted with Mrs. Central Lever's famous tragedy, The Gamester. <laughs> Nothing could possibly put the vice of gaming in such a detestable light as the distress of that play. St. Paul himself borrowed a line from a play by Euripides when he wrote, evil communication corrupts good manners. Absurd notions come not from any rational examination of, of the nature of dramatic entertainments nor of perusal of plays themselves, but from the prejudiced accounts of hot-brained enthusiasts with gross ignorance of the, the most frequently acted plays in the English language, who will uh, never make the smallest ceremony of, of seeking out all whose opinions differ from their own and attacking in a manner indecent and illiberal. Now those uh, enemies of the theater who do have any pretensions to sense and learning are generally a gloomy lot, rendered hot and intolerant by some enthusiastic notions of religion. I cannot see what right any set of men have to prescribe the amusements of others. If you find it agreeable to your health and inclination to go see a play, what right? consistent with that liberty which every British subject ought to enjoy, has any man to endeavor to prevent you from amusing yourself. I am firmly persuaded that many derive advantages from the well-wrought scenes of plays. And in that conviction, I 
I flatter myself I may without arrogance presume that I am not entirely unuseful to society. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Um, again, we, we don't wish to keep you, and I believe you had told me that you had an appointment at quarter oh. to three o'clock. Thank you, dear. I do, uh, yes, another meeting. <sighs> some people who uh, know some people who know some people. Uh, Mr. Hughes, Mr. Wall, if you would be so kind, please uh, deliver our new friends to the tavern for their lodging and uh, take Lewis to the house to see his mother. Friends, this will soon be over. After a full season here, we will move on to Philadelphia. And by next Christmas, we'll be back home in Williamsburg, where I'm sure we'll see our old friend, Mr. Randolph, at the theater night after night. Wonderful to meet all of you. God save His Majesty and uh, learn your lines. All of our programming is made possible through donations from viewers like you.